Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out to our event. I'm Michael, mm -hmm. event host at RJ Julia. We're joined tonight by acclaimed author Ilion Wu. We celebrate the paperback release of her books, Master, Slave, Husband, Wife. We'll hear from Ilion and learn more about the book. We'll have a chance uh, for questions from the audience, so you can start thinking about those now. And then after the discussion, we'll have a book signing. Uh, just near the main entrance, there's a desk there, so right where most of you came in, uh, to be signing and personalizing the, the book afterwards. We have copies of the paperback uh, of Master, Slave, Husband, Wife, uh, both at this register and the register next door that you're welcome to pick up if you haven't already. Uh, so uh, in one of the things as I was uh, preparing or getting ready, you know, the short uh, introduction, one of the quotes that stood out the most to me was from uh, another a Pulitzer winning author, Debbie Applegate, who mentioned uh, in describing Ilion's work, uh, American history would be everyone's favorite subject if more historians wrote like this. <laughs> Ilion Wu is the New York Times bestselling author of Master, Slave, Husband, Wife and The Great Divorce. Her writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, Time, and the New York Times. She holds a BA in the Humanities from Yale College and a PhD in English from Columbia University. Her book, Master, Slave, Husband, Wife, was named among the New York Times 10 best books of 2023. Now they always put out like 100 best books, and then a little while later, you get this is the top 10 books, and that mm -hmm. included paperback or included fiction and nonfiction across all genres. So we're very excited to have her tonight. Uh, we'll let her tell you more about the story if uh, if you haven't read it already. But uh, this is the exciting story of Ellen and William Kraft, uh, who went to great measures to escape slavery in 1848. Here to tell us more about uh, that journey and hopefully about herself, Ilion Wu. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming out on this wet evening. Mm -hmm. um, I personally love to curl up with a book on a, on, on a night like this, and I'm glad you're all out here with me. Um, it's really exciting to be here uh, in Connecticut, where I went to school, and also here for my, this is my first public paperback event, so this kicks it off, and, um, and thank you again for being here with me. Um, so what I thought I would do tonight is first to introduce you a bit to the crafts and their remarkable story. Um, maybe we'll slide into the 19th century a little bit with a short reading. Um, and then, you know, I've been traveling really for just about a year now with the crafts and their story. And I thought I might uh, go through the sort of the top five questions that I've gotten mm -hmm. um, along these events. Uh, and then um, do some Q&A, which is really one of my favorite parts of these kind of talks. So I'm going to give you actually a slightly abridged version of the one of the opening scenes of the book. It's not the opening chapter, but this actually was uh, reprinted in the Boston Globe. They did kind of a, uh, it was almost like a, I don't know if it's like a greatest hits from the book or something like that, but they pick these different pieces and put them together and shorten them. So I'm gonna give you a slightly shorter uh, sh shorter version of a scene that really launches the crash journey in Macon in 1848. It is pre-dawn in Macon, Georgia, and at four o'clock on this December morning in 1848, the city does not move. But the Okmulgee River flows along the eastern shore, and so too an enslaved couple moves, ready to transform in a cabin in the shadow of a tall white mansion. They have scarcely slept these past few nights as they rehearse the moves they now perform. Ellen removes her gown, foregoing a corset for once, though she needs to flatten or bind the swell in her breasts. She pulls on a white shirt with a long vest a loose coat and slim-legged pants, a handsome cloak to cover it all. She dresses by candlelight. All around are the tools of her trade as a seamstress, work baskets stocked with needles and thread, pins, scissors, cloth. Her husband's handiwork is in evidence as well, wood furniture, including a chest of drawers, now unlocked. Ellen slips her feet into gentlemen's boots, thick-soled and solid. 
Though she has practiced, they must feel strange, an inch of leaden weight pulling each soul to the ground, an extra inch she needs. Ella may have inherited her father's pale complexion, but not his height. Even for a woman, she is small. William towers beside her, casting long shadows at her wounds. They must do something with her hair, which she has just cut, gather it up, pack it. To leave it behind would be to leave a clue. There are the final touches, a silky black cravat, also the bandages. Ellen wears one around her chin, another around her hand, which she pops in a sling. She has more protection for her face, green tinted glasses and an extra tall silk hat. These additions hide her smoothness, her fear, her scars. Ellen stands at the center of the floor, now transformed. To all appearances, it leaves a thick, rich, white young man, a most respectable looking gentleman in her husband's words. He is ready too in his usual pants and shirt with only one new item, a white secondhand beaver hat. Nicer than anything he has worn before, <laughs> the marker of a rich man's slave. To think it had been a matter of days, four days since they had first agreed to the idea, first called it possible. Four days of stuffing clothing into locked compartments, sewing, shopping, mapping the way. Four days to prepare for the run of a lifetime. William blows out the light. They kneel and pray in the sudden dark. They stand and wait, breath held. Is that someone listening, watching outside? Just beyond the door is the back of the Collins house where master and mistress should be asleep in bed. The young couple, holding hands, step to the front of the cottage as gently as they can. William unlocks the door, pushes it open, peers out. There is just the circle of trees, the whispering of leaves, such stillness he thinks of death. Nevertheless, he gives the sign to go. And it continues. <laughs> So the story, this is the story of Ellen and William Craft, a remarkable enslaved couple who in 1848 embarked on this extraordinary journey of mutual self-emancipation. So they are actually, as you have learned, a husband and wife, but they pretend to be master and slave, with Ellen passing herself as a rich, white, disabled man. So crossing boundaries of gender, race, class, and ability to go on this extraordinary escape. So um, the story is a love story to begin with. Um, it's a love story that begins with their love for each other, but even before that, with love that they have inherited from their parents, Ellen from her mother, Maria, an enslaved woman, and William from his parents, and the love that he shared with his family member. So this is a love, this family love is what prepares them for their love with each other, and it's ultimately in order to be able to have children out of bondage and to pass on this love that they, they, they decide to make this harrowing um, and risky escape. So in fact, the subtitle for this book was originally an American love story, which I really loved myself, but the publisher asked me to change it because it didn't seem quite clear enough. But the, the, this theme of love really runs through from beginning to end. So this is a love that carried them to, through their the journey of their escape. But this, the, the story doesn't stop there because what happens is that the crafts decide not just to stop at the point at which they reach the North, but they embark upon another journey, telling their story, sharing it with the world, traveling initially another 1,000 miles across New England, captivating crowds of people, and speaking in support of the anti-slavery cause. And then even beyond that, they become uh, test cases for the Fugitive Slave Act, which passes in 1850. And then they become really, um, they become a test case, not just for this act, but really for the future of slavery in America. So this is a love story. It's also, a very much an American story, and they make it an American story because they go beyond their own escape um, to something much larger, and they really go out to change the world. So um, what I'd like to do with this now that I've given this bit of an overview, I've gotten our 
Eat Right in the 19th Century, is to sort of take on these top five questions that I've gotten um, across the year in different places having to do with the crafts and their story. And the first one that I, I get really most often is, how did you learn about the crafts and come to write the story? So the simple answer is really, I entered the story as a reader. I was in graduate school at Columbia at the time. I was really wrestling with uh, a lot of literary theory and things that I didn't want to read. I felt like I was picking apart literature, being asked to pick apart the literature more than I was really able to read it. And in this class that I was taking called the Literature of Passing, this narrative was assigned. And I sat down and I feel like I heard the story. It was a, it felt like a really intense, almost kind of physical experience of receiving the story, reading it on the page, but also really hearing it um, in my ear. And the, the story, it's a 60 page narrative. And it really, I mean, they take you through this incredible adventure, which I, I, I follow this in my book, but the outlines of the journey um, are all there. But there are all kinds of questions that they don't answer. They, they really focus in on the journey itself. They don't talk about what happened before. They talk very little about what happened after. Um, and what I wanted to know was about the before, the after, and the in-between. So these questions like what were the relationships like with their family members, with their enslavers, who did they love, who did they leave, um, what are the choices that, that they made once they were out in the North. Those are things that I wanted to know more about and they sort of haunted me over the years. So that's sort of where the, 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 the book journey comes from. But in some ways, I feel like the roots of the story and the connection for me came even much earlier than that. They were rooted in the ways in which I was taught history um, as a child. So I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I attended a really wonderful school, um, a public, they call it kind of alternative school called the King Open School, named after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the way that I was introduced to history was not through flat texts, not through memorization, not through dates, but really um, sounds and images and um, like we would hear speeches, we would see film clips, we would see pictures of people on the wall. So that's one of the things I remember most vividly. Um, when I had my first research paper to write, my teachers papered the wall, um, papered a wall with images of um, Black activists and heroes over the century. And I got to choose one and I chose uh, Benjamin Banneker. Um, so a lot of the history that I got in those years is what would be considered now or called uh, black history, but it wasn't really, it wasn't separated out that way. It was history, it was American history. Mm -hmm. And what I found when I changed schools and I entered a school system in, that was much more text-based was that the histories that I grew up with, um, and I mean, we talk about all kinds of subjects in this school, a difficult subject. Mm -hmm. And when I hear people talk about, well, are kids ready for this um, difficult material? I think back to my own experiences, but we learned about, um, we had units on the Holocaust. We had, uh, we, we debated the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and tackled really tough issues. Um, but back to the textbooks. Once I got to the textbooks, I found that a lot of the history, the texture history that I had received in my early education literally became pushed into the margins, into sort of social history or black history, or this is a little bit about women's history at the end. That's the way the books were written for such a long time. And I think in many ways, my work on this book um, and my own quest in terms of my later education has been to sort of to try to figure out how to put these two different kinds of history together. Um, when I got to Yale, actually, my learning got even wider. Um, but that was actually kind of by design. Uh, when I started at Yale, I really wanted to take this uh, series of courses. It's called Directed Studies. I don't know, are there any Yaleys in the room? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so, so I'll have to explain what this is. Directed Studies is, it really kind of marches you through the history and politics and literature of uh, Western civilization from your starting at 
you know, Plato and you're running, and it's like a marathon all the way to the present. Um, there were controversies over this, this great books program. And when I was a freshman and I was in this program, the Dean um, Donald Kagan didn't do us any favors by coming out to all those freshmen and saying, you guys all need to learn this Western Civ stuff. This is really the best stuff. And I, I mean, he didn't use that word, those words obviously, but mm -hmm. that's what it translated to. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, dude, you just made my life so hard. If I didn't have to explain before, like why I was doing this great book stuff, because I got some pushback. Um, I got pushback for why are you an Asian American woman studying these like quote unquote, you know, white great books. There are all kinds of divisions I found that people were making between, you know, different subject matters, types of learning, um, uh, different areas of the world and who should be studying what. And mm -hmm. that was confusing for me. Um, I wanted to I wanted to immerse myself in these books and in this tradition because I wanted to know what were these texts that had such a formative impact on our civilization here? And what exactly is a great book anyway? Um, I wanted to explore that. And and I and I did. And I think that once I came to the craft narrative. So if we go back to Columbia and I'm sitting in that darkened library and I'm looking at this story, I think I was primed to react to the story because of the, the, the multi-textured education I had um, when I was a child where I was really attuned to listening to stories and seeing different people. Um, and also my Yale education and these studies into the great books because I saw this great book. I recognized this. As a great story when I read it. So that's a very long first question. Um, if I don't get to all five questions, then I will just open it up to you, and maybe you'll ask either one of the questions that I've <laughs> um, encountered a lot of times or our new ones. So another um, another question that I get a lot is how it how it is that I was able to um, sort of create the world of the craft. There are all kinds of details in the book and the question has to do with how did I know, for example, what they ate and what they stopped or what things looked like along the journey. And this, I enjoy this question because it's very much a goal um, in my writing this book. It was to really try to enter into this world that the crafts were living in with all the senses. So to to evoke through sound and through taste and through smell and through feel. So you really felt like you were there. So the crafts themselves do a wonderful job describing scenes, but they don't actually do a lot of the sort of background work because they have an important story to tell in the foreground. So what I tried to do, what I did um, in order to excavate these different um, details was really to rely on a whole host of really interesting, but completely unstable and at times unreliable uh, secondary narrators or camera people. Um, the way I kind of think about it as is as like, if you're cutting a film, I try to I try to get different points of view into the journey. So the crafts, for example, might not be talking about their station stops and what they're eating or where you go to the bathroom when you're on this particular leg of the journey. But there were lots of people in the 19th century who were traveling and they were writing about their experiences. And so I looked into these travel narratives, especially by disgruntled British travelers. <laughs> these guys were like always in the Oh, this food sucks, or oh, and I'm like, oh, tell me. <laughs> that's where you get into the texture. That's where you get into the texture, the, the smells and taste. So sometimes these guys, you know, they'd be focused on this tree and I'm like, just leave the tree alone. Can we move the camera a little bit? So there is, you're getting a very specific plant with these different points of view, but that's really what I tried to do, um, to, find, to find other people who could give eyewitness testimony. And I would find actually, especially with, I mean, they really were into the geography and things like that too. When I, when I traveled along the Potomac, sort of trying to recreate the journey of the crafts, it, it's it's uncanny how it was like hearing these descriptions come to life. So like people now will take selfies and they take videos and, and, and post about the things they're seeing. This was the equivalent back then. And they were really good at what they did. And it's really strange how little much of this terrain has changed. And that's, I would say, both physically and metaphorically. 
Um, one actually, another thing I wanted to add on, on, on to this camera angles is how important it was to look not only at the people who were friendly to the crafts, but in many situations, the enemy press or people who are not supportive of abolitionists. And this really ties into now. I mean, it's so important to have a wide range of voices. And you never know what you're going to get from a different source. So for example, the abolitionist papers are really, you know, they're celebrating the crafts when they're talking on the road. And they're, um, you know, everything, like the crafts are speaking in front of thousands and you're seeing the applause and you're seeing the roars of yes and yes and yes, um, cheering them on. But it's the enemy papers, uh, enemy papers maybe is too strong a word, but the Boston Post and people who are skeptical of the activists, um, they are the ones who will actually hear, for example, when there is this loud call and response and they and somebody is saying, will you send these people back to slavery? Who's going to do that? It's supposed to be nobody, right? But there is a lone yes. So it's a, it's it's another newspaper man who hears that. It's also another newspaper man who notices that at one point when the crafts are hearing a friend talk about his losses and experience in bondage, he's the one who notices their tears on stage. Mm -hmm. That's something that the um, the abolitionists left out because everybody's telling their own kind of story. So to see to to approach a story from multiple points of view, vantage point is is so important. Um, what in the research process surprised you? That's another question that I get a lot and I can answer it in a zillion different ways because really this is a research journey that I was surprised at every turn. My first book, The Great Divorce, I had like a few really powerful Eureka moments and they usually took place in archives. With this, it was nonstop, whether I was in an archive in Macon, Georgia, or actually in the kitchen looking at newspapers online. There were times when I would shout and my children would be like, what's going on at the first few times? And then they're like, oh, she's had another Eureka moment. <laughs> but it just happened. Um, it happened that often. And um, I guess I'll let you discover some of the surprises for yourself in the story, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe do a little bit of a sensational turn. One thing that really surprised me is the dark ends that many of the craft's enemies met. It was really kind of uncanny with one critical exception. But these terrible things, what happened to these people when we pursued them? And I, I remember being, that was one of those shouting moments. I was like, no way, he got stabbed through the liver. Um, <laughs> but it was, a, it, it almost, I felt sometimes like I was dabbling in tabloid journalism, but it was, um, <laughs> I'm just so glad that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. Tabloid journalism. Tabloid journalism. Well, people magazine. Uh, because one of the things I'm very proud of, uh, I mean, I'm a New York Times reader and I'm very proud to be a top to have the yeah. book made the top 10 of the New York Times that we shared, but it's also the top 10 for people. And I was thinking about this. Um, I, I have been an avid people reader. And there's something that I really appreciate about people, which is that if you're not really up to date on pop culture, which I am not, I'm mostly communing with dead people in the 1970s. On the spot, I will open up a people magazine. I won't know what's going on. And you'll find like a, you know, there's like a group called like, that I've never heard of called like Blackpink. And you might be like, Everybody knows who's black pink. It's just so how uh, this is my example. Okay. So I I I don't know who black pink is in the beginning. And um some but in, but in the first, you know, like first page, there's one of the group, it's a it's a it's a group. Um one of them is wearing like a really cool pink boot. And then a couple pages later, there's a profile of somebody's love interest or something. And by the end of the book, you know, all these little bits, I feel like I know these people. And it's a very particular world. But you get introduced and sort of seduced into <laughs> seeing this whole world. So what I kind of felt like, um, so obviously this is no, um, no, I'm not trying to make a light of any of what I'm writing about here because I, what I'm writing about is is pretty serious. Um, uh, but what I did try to do is to 
bring in a whole full cast of characters. Um, and if you are, let's say for example, like having to do with abolitionists, if you are in the know, then this is like People Magazine for you. I mean, I've had so many different people coming in and really interesting tidbits. And so it's, it, it'll be like name dropping um, if, you're, if, if, you're, if you're like me. So this is like Abolition People Magazine for me. Um, but if you don't know, then little by little, I'm hoping that you'll learn tidbits about the various characters so that by the end, when you get to the end of the book, and if you have the like hardcover and you're revisiting the end papers where these, these images appear, then you know this world as well. So I wanted to give history by osmosis. Um, so there's my People Magazine tribute and connection. Um, are there descendants today and have you been in touch with them? That's one of my favorite questions um, to get because one of my, one of the best parts of this journey has been getting to know the craft, descendants of the craft. And when you think about the fact that, so I, I started earlier by saying that the crafts ran um, with the love of their family members at their backs, but also looking forward um, to the children uh, that they wanted to have in freedom. I think about this deed that I came across in uh, Megan Courthouse, and it's a deed by which Ellen Crafts father, her biological father, who was also her first enslaver. It's a deed by which he gives her away as a wedding present to her own half-sister, um, Eliza Smith Collins. And this, this piece of paper is beautifully penned, and the, the, the beauty of the letters is such a, makes such a contrast to the horrific action that in it. In it. What's terrific about it is not only that Ellen is being given away as this piece of property, but there's note that it's not just her who belongs to Eliza and her descendants, but her increase. So this is a this is a will without a, an end. It goes on in perpetuity. So it it not only bounds Ellen Ellen to Eliza, but Ellen's descendants to Eliza's descendants, and this would have gone on and on and on and on. So to meet these descendants. Um, to know that the crafts, when they made their escape, they were breaking these bonds, these bonds, not just for themselves, but for this increase. And then to meet the increase in person has been extraordinary. And they are, um, they are activists, they are poets, they are scholars, they are media makers, they are uh, chefs, they are doing all kinds of things all over the world. And I think they have a new organization that they're founding together as a family. You can actually follow William and Ellen Craft on Instagram, mm -hmm. and you can connect well, with their organization yeah. of descendants. Um, uh, and they're they're doing incredible things. And actually, I just looked at my calendar, and it was a year ago today, uh, actually a year ago tomorrow, that I first met three of the great great granddaughters at the grave of William Craft, wow. um, in outside of Charleston or in Charleston, um, South Carolina. Um, so that's an experience that I will never forget. The last question, I actually don't really like this question. Um, <laughs> so I could just move to Q&A, but... Uh, <laughs> At least tell us what the question is, so nobody asks. <laughs> it's fair to say, yeah, don't like this question. Let's talk about it. <laughs> it is, has your book been banned? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Why is your book in banning? Wow. Serious issue with question mm -hmm. banning, and it and it um it troubles me. Um, and I, I believe that no book should be banned. Exactly. But for me, the idea that the crafts would be banned seems. Mm. Can I say this? Un-American. Mm -hmm. Um, because the crafts, when you when you look at them from the very first page of their narrative, you think from the beginning of their run, they are running in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. They say that two lines move them. One is a biblical verse, but the other is um, from the Declaration of Independence. So they are taking these American principles and they are living them to the fullest. And not only are they living them, but then they're preaching them and they're teaching the rest of the world and they're showing them by example. And not only that, not only do they talk and they fight this anti-slavery cause, but after the Civil War, at every point when they could have a much easier way out, 
they actually decide to come back to America and make America into what it needs to be. Um, so in my eyes, they are a true American hero. And rather than being banned, I hope they'll be taught everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think Good. that's it for my Q&A. Um, and I would love to receive questions from you. Yes. What was the biblical verse that you're referring to? The biblical verse, and I don't want to mangle it, so I have it right here, but it's... Um, is it the Old Testament or the New Testament? It is... Um, oh, you know what? It's not going to be It's God... Um, having been... Um, oh, it's been hard to be But no, I actually, I thought I had the crafts... Um, God having made all um um right. and mangling it. Uh, made of one blood all nations of men. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where is that verse, please? Uh uh back or the Acts. Acts. And then the Declaration, of course, is we hold these truths to be self-evident. You mean the Declaration of Independence? Yes, the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, you said the Declaration of Christ. Oh, no. no. Declaration okay. Of Christ. okay, thank you. Yes, um, I was just wondering, if it, if it, when I was reading the book, I, I read half of it today, and and uh, it was just so vivid, it had so many pictures in my mind. And I was kind of thinking, well, this would make an amazing movie, and I wondered if anybody has approached you, and if, if so, or if not, I mean, what do you feel about that, if, if somebody wanted to make a movie out of this? I think that's probably question number six. It might be question number five, and I think it better, so if I put it together, that's what I'm going to ask. I, I mean, I think it would make an amazing movie. I mean, it really, um, it, it, mm. it's it got like, and you can do it in so many different ways. It's got a built-in Hollywood arc. Um, for me personally, when I was writing, when I was writing the book and I got stuck, I really did think about cinema and how it would unfold cinematically. So if there's sort of a cinematic feeling to this, it's because that's what I was very consciously doing. Um, when I amassed so much research, it got to be really challenging to figure out, well, I don't want to lead with a story and I do want to put all these like side details in, but how do I know what's important, and what's not in that? So in a movie unfolds in time and you can only focus on one thing at a time. So when I tried to sort of picture it in my mind's eye, it helped me distill that down and really um, use what's absolutely necessary to create more of a sort of muscular um, narrative. But I agree with you. I would love to see it as a movie. You know, the crafts themselves, they are speaking um, on these lecture stages, but they're also speaking with William Wallace Brown. I am sorry about William Wallace Brown, but he is dazzling. Yeah. And he is a great charismatic speaker. Mm -hmm. And he he creates this panorama, which is like a giant painting, which moves it's like from here, like all the way to the other side. And the lights are low, and he's lighting up different parts of the picture as he's telling the story. Right. It's really a precursor of the movie. I think it's meet a lot of people too that might not, you know, read the book like that. That means you know, to get the story out to more people too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I want to thank you for being here. Um, and I wanted to say that when I read your book. Emotionally, I felt so sad because of the struggles that they had. And once they came back and they still were not accepted or they had to struggle with the burdens. And, and you know, it was just, it's, I thought you did a great job in expressing exactly what was going on and, and what was happening to people at this time when they should have been able to live a life like like those around them thank you thank you for that comment it's something that that's a question that i really or or a matter that i really considered deeply from the very beginning which is that you know the crafts and narratives like these you want to celebrate these stories as okay they crossed the they crossed over to the north and they lived happily ever after but that's not what happened the, that dividing line between North and South isn't so neat. And in fact, they actually have to leave 
the entire nation. They have to leave the United States of America in order to be free. Um, and I mean, I guess in the end, yes, it's pretty depressing the things that they suffer again and again. But for me, even more than that, what's inspiring about them and what I found inspirational as I, you know, as I traveled my way through the story and through this book is their incredible resilience mm -hmm. and their determination to rewrite these wrongs and to imagine something different. So for me, that is what shines through in the end. Um, even if there is no happy ending. Yes. No, I thank you for being here too. Yeah. Um, I found too, you could almost see them growing. I mean, I in the beginning of the book, I would never imagine that they'd be out lecturing and being these pro abolitionists and, and talking amongst thousands of people when they seem so shy and timid in the beginning. And so that was really heartwarming and really kudos to that. I mean, it's, it's so heroic what they've done. Um, but one little question, I suppose I could go back to the book and find out, but did um, Eliza know that Ellen was my half sister? That is an excellent question. I mean, she must have known. You would have guessed, right? Um, I mean, I've, I'm thinking about in terms of, I don't have any evidence or anything written in Eliza King. So there's a wonderful painting of her. Um, that I was not able to secure the rights for, but I do use that to just to, to evoke that physical description of her. Um, but she must have, because Ellen's whole crisis in her childhood was that she bore such a striking physical resemblance to her father that everybody, uh, visitors to the house, would presume that she was a legitimate child of the family. And that was enraging to um, her biological father's wife. Um, but back to actually before what you were saying about the crafts, people would ask that, you know, people would wonder how did these people who had lived their lives in bondage, you know, public speaking experience, whatever, how did they become so, um, uh, how are they so comfortable and persuasive on the stage? But again, if you think about it, the kinds of um, experiences that they had endured as children, um, the performances that they had to put on, for example, when they are, when they're being forced through unspeakable trauma and they're not allowed to show that. Um, when William is um, uh, on an auction block and seeing his sister sold and he's not allowed to cry, he's not allowed to speak. I mean, those performances uh, are so far above and beyond anything that they will encounter afterwards that uh, they're already, even if they haven't done any public speaking, they are already seasoned. They already have the life experience they need to be able to tell their story. Yeah. Thank you for the um, a vocation of the abolitionist world, the speaking world. Mm -hmm. And when we read about Frederick Douglass, he's speaking, but what did we find out about the time? That which is over them. You don't mention that they overlap, but their but their worlds both have. Uh, they did actually, and there's one there's one particularly powerful moment that the, the, the newspapers take across the country. This is not a public moment; it's a private moment. I'll let you discover the public moments um, with Douglas and the crafts and He actually uh, helps introduce them um, to the grand, the, the giant abolitionist plane. But there's a moment um, when. The slave hunters are after the craft, and um, really Boston is like bubbling like a pot, as it's been described. There's terror everywhere. There's slave, there are not just the two Georgians, but other slave hunters, potential kidnappers everywhere. And William is out. He is not hiding. He is armed and he's out. And he and Douglas are walking in the streets of Boston, and then this carriage comes so close, and they think that it's that, that the people in this carriage are menacing and they're going to grab William. And Frederick Douglass at that point says, you know, maybe you should leave. And he says, I will. And William says, I am not going to leave because I'm standing here for, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, but if, if I leave, who can stand? And um, and Douglas makes clear, you could die in this, right? Um, and Douglas says, and William says, I am prepared to die. And Douglas says, if you die, our people can live. Um, and these words echo down. And actually, one of the most Powerful things I found was evidence that there were people in the South, in Macon, enslaved people, 
who would have heard, if not those very words, in similar scenes. So the cr crafts are almost sort of like telegraphing um, messages down to the South and really only the news. Did they ever travel together? They didn't travel together, but they shared the stage together. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you're writing nonfiction, um, how do you decide where are the endings? Hmm. Where the ending is? Well, in a way, there's a central driving question that starts the story. And I guess the ending comes when that question is answered. Okay. So for me, that really had to do with when the crafts are fully free, and not only free physically, but free to make the choices and how they're going to live their lives. When are they accomplished that push their goals of literacy, of having a family, and really sort of um, defining freedom for themselves. So that's for me when the story closed. But it was hard because they go, they have, a, there's a lot more to their lives than the freedom journey. Okay, thank you. That was a really great question and like a startlingly concise way of answering that. Really good. Would you like to take one more question? Sure. Yes. What happens on or will you be defined for that story? I have a question. Yeah, that mm, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I have different stories that are sort of floating in my head, but right now, I mean, this oral storytelling has become a pretty big part of my life. I've been speaking a lot over the course of the year, and I'll be speaking more through the spring. Um, and I'm I'm really putting the, my energies there now, especially talking to schools and and figuring out other ways. Somebody said maybe a movie is a way, um, but um, other ways through images and through web resources that I'm developing to animate the story. The other stories that come next, one, I think they both require that I relearn languages and all kinds of things, so I'm going to just sort of take that for now. <laughs> I wonder how long it took her to write them. But thank you so very much. Oh.